Well, hey, good morning, Center Church, and happy 4th of July weekend. My name is Josh Miller, and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest with us here today, do me a favor, just below this live stream, click the connect button, uh, and that way we can follow up with you this week to see if there's any way that we can be praying for you or if there's anything that you need uh, in this season of life. Well, last week, we started a new sermon series looking at the life of Abraham, and I told you that we are going to spend 17 weeks, so now 16 weeks, looking at the life of Abraham because he's one of the most significant people in the Bible and really in world history. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all trace their lineage back to Abraham. So if you want to understand world events, you really need to understand who this man was. And in particular for us, Abraham is called the father of our faith. So the more that you understand Abraham and his relationship with God, the more you're going to understand yourself and your relationship with God. Well, last week, we looked at Abraham's conversion. We looked at the first part of Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham began his personal relationship with God. And today, we're going to look at the first time that Abraham's faith was tested. The first time that Abraham walked through a hard season, a difficult season with his faith. And I will just go ahead and warn you now, it isn't pretty. Okay, Abraham walked through a hard time and he didn't do very well. If the first half of chapter 12 is all about Abraham's obedience, the second half of chapter 12 is all about Abraham's disobedience when things got hard. And they got pretty hard. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 with me. It says this, Now there was a famine in the land. The word famine means scarcity. And in Abraham's case, it was scarcity of food. But in your case, it could be scarcity of romance. It could be scarcity of close friendships. It could be scarcity of purpose in your job. Abraham was in the promised land. He had begun his relationship with God, and yet he was walking through hard times. He was facing a famine. He was facing scarcity. And this story is really all about one question. How will you respond when you face the famine? How will you respond when things are difficult? Will you live with faith, with faith in the midst of the famine? And this is a relevant question for all of us because here's what we all know. There will always be something hard happening in your life. There will always be something hard happening in your life. I don't have to convince you right now in the midst of all that we're going through that life can be challenging, but we all know even after this core, even after the pandemic settles down, even after things get back to a little bit of normal, life always has challenges. So no matter where you're coming from this morning, whether you are just asking questions about Christianity and, and you're seeking spiritual answers or you're a seasoned saint, we all need to learn from Abraham how to live with faith in the midst of of famine. And we're going to do that by looking at Abraham's negative example. Okay. Sometimes you look at characters in the Bible and you learn from their positive example. In this case, we are going to learn from Abraham's failure. So hopefully we don't make the same mistakes. And by looking at his story, we're going to learn three things not to do when you experience famine in your life. Three things not to do when you experience famine in your life. So if you have a Bible, meet me in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. That is where we are going to start today. And as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context so you know what's going on. Before beginning his relationship with God, Abram lived in the city of Ur. And Ur was a large city in southern Iraq that was built along the Euphrates River. Well, God called Abram out of Ur and he said, I want you to go to the land of Canaan, which is about 400 miles from Ur. And when you think Canaan, just imagine modern day Israel, okay? It's not an exact equivalent, but it sort of gives you an idea of where we're talking about. Well, after some starts and stops, some bumps in the road, Abram finally arrives in Canaan. And when he got there, God made him two major promises. He said, Abram, I'm going to give you this land to possess, and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of descendants to possess it. So God promised to, get, to give Abraham a land and a lineage, a people and a place. That was verse 7. Then we read in verse 9 that Abram moved his family out of the more populated regions of Canaan down to the south to the less populated region called the Negev. And that brings us up to verse 10. Read it with me. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land." The Negev was a pretty dry region and it was affected pretty regularly by seasonal rainfall. So if it didn't get enough rainfall, famine would result. So famine was pretty common in this area, but this particular famine was really, really bad. That's why the text says that the famine was severe in the land. And it's important to note that Abraham wasn't familiar with famine. 
Remember, Abraham grew up in Ur. He spent the majority of his life in a large populated city built along the Euphrates River. Well, cities that are built along rivers are pretty famine resistant, right? Rivers are not as affected by seasonal rainfall as a region like the Negev. So, man, it's not unreasonable to imagine that this was the first severe famine that Abram had ever encountered. This was the first time that he had ever experienced this kind of scarcity. And some of you may be experiencing a similar thing right now. For some of you, this season of pandemic may be the first time that you've experienced famine in your life, or it may be the most severe famine that you have ever experienced. Economic instability, relational isolation, tension in our communities. This may be the most severe famine that you have ever faced. Either way, I wonder if you can identify with how Abram responded. Look back at verse 10 with me. It says this, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. That word so means in response to or as a result of. So as a result of the famine, Abram left the promised land. As a result of the famine, as a result of the scarcity, Abram left the land that God had promised him and he went down to the land of Egypt. Now, Why did Abram go to Egypt? Well, the text doesn't tell us exactly, but there are a couple of conclusions that we can draw. Number one, Egypt was built around the Nile River. So it, just like Ur, was protected from famine. So there were greater economic opportunities in Egypt. Number two, Egypt was culturally significant and organized around large cities. Abram grew up in Ur. He was culturally comfortable in large cities, much more so than he was as a traveling herdsman in Canaan. He understood city life. He understood city culture. So Egypt would have been much more culturally comfortable for him. And number three, many people from Canaan would have been going down to Egypt to sojourn there. So conventional wisdom would have been leave Canaan during the famine and go down to Egypt. Have you ever found yourself doing what Abram did? Have you ever found yourself in hardship, scarcity, and instead of asking, where has God called me to be, instead you ask the question, where can I get the best job, right? What kind of city do I want to live in, or or what are all my friends doing? It's extremely clear that Abram was supposed to be in Canaan. God moved him 400 miles to get him there. And then just in verse seven, three verses before this, God told him explicitly to your offspring, I will give this land. What land? Canaan, not Egypt. Abram was supposed to be in Canaan. And yet when things got hard, he left his calling and he went down to Egypt. And friends, we are tempted to do the very same thing in our lives. When things get hard, we are tempted to abandon our calling for the sake of comfort which leads us to the first thing that we learned from Abraham. Number one, when you experience famine, don't abandon your calling. When you experience famine, don't abandon your calling. Maybe you're a young professional and and you've studied the scriptures and you are convinced that God has called you to seek the welfare of your city, to love and serve your neighbor and to be an agent of positive change in your community. But friend, that takes time. It takes time to understand your community, to understand the history of your community. It takes time to build trust, to understand how to serve your neighbors and how to love your neighbors. But it's been two years and you're bored, right? You're bored of your city. You've been on all the great hikes. You've been to all the cool restaurants and bars and you're just bored of your city and your job isn't as exciting as it once was and you're not dating anyone. So what are you tempted to do? Move, right? You're tempted to find a new city and think that's gonna solve all of my problems. I just need to go to a new city, a bigger city, a smaller city, a city in the Northeast, a sort of city on the West Coast. I just need to find a different city. And so you are tempted just like Abram to leave where God has called you for the sake of comfort. Or maybe, maybe you're a mom who feels called to stay at home with your kids, to raise them in the training and instruction of the Lord, to love them, shape them and provide for them. But kids are hard. Right? Being at home is often lonely, tiring, and thankless. While your friend is running a meeting at work, you're digging goldfish out of the couch while your four-year-old rolls all the toilet paper off the roll. Right? Not that that's ever happened in my house, okay? But you know, hypothetically, that's happening. So what are you tempted to do? You're tempted to go get a job. Right? I'm not saying it's wrong for moms to work, just like I'm not saying it's wrong to ever move a city. But what I'm saying is you need to be very careful that in the midst of hardship and discomfort, 
You don't make comfort your new North Star. You don't say, man, you know, I think God called me here, but this is really hard. So now I'm going to go where it's most comfortable or it's easiest or where I can get the best job, make the most money or have the most fun. Friend, if you are a Christian, the North Star in your life is no longer comfort. It is God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom. When you became a Christian, you traded in, you traded in comfort and personal autonomy and ease for meaning and purpose and glory and advancement. That's what happened. So my question to you is, in this hard season, what is the North Star of your life? Is the North Star of your life comfort? Is the North Star of your life ease? Is the North Star of your life, man, what I want to do most, what will give me the most satisfaction? Or friend, is the North Star of your life God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom and where he has called you to be? Abram shows us that it's possible to have a relationship with God while living according to the values of this world. Whenever we experience famine, we are tempted to abandon, our call, to abandon our calling for convenience, to choose comfort over kingdom. But Abram is a warning to us that it doesn't end well when we do. Let's keep reading. This is verse 11. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. So let me tell you exactly what just happened in those verses in case you missed it. Just before Abram enters Egypt, he pulls his wife aside and he says, Sarai, you're a beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, one of them is going to kill me so that he can take you to be his wife so that he can sleep with you. So here's the plan. Sarah, I need you to tell them that you're my sister, not my wife, and thus you are sexually available. That way, one of them will take you into his house to make you his wife, and as a result, I'll get stuff. That is not me exaggerating. That is exactly what Abraham asked his wife to do. And we're supposed to read this and be shocked and disgusted and dismayed. Father Abraham is asking his wife to become the wife of another man who will definitely sleep with her so that Abraham can save his own skin. This is a pitiful illustration of Abraham's moral character and how he viewed women. The fact that he asked his wife to do this is repugnant. So what happened? What happened to the Abraham of verses one through nine, who's leaving Haran, who's marching off into the wilderness, not knowing where he's going, but trusting God? What happened to that Abraham? Why did he do this horrible thing? Because he was afraid. Because he was afraid. If you look carefully at verses 11 through 13, you'll notice that Abraham has no actual data about what is going to happen, but he is consumed with fear. Friends, nothing's happened yet. They're not even in Egypt. They're on the border of Egypt, but Abraham is thinking about the future and he's inserting fear into the unknown. And he allowed that fear to motivate him to make the shameful request of his wife. In verses one through nine, Abram lived by faith. And in verses 10 through 20, Abram lived by fear. And it's a warning to us, as Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner points out about how quickly that change can happen. Kidner says this, this is revealing of how suddenly you can transition from the plane of faith to that of fear. Which leads us to the second warning for us from this passage. Number two, when you experience famine, don't live by fear. When you experience famine, don't live by fear. Anytime we experience famine, scarcity, or hardship, it breeds fear in our lives, and fear can lead us to do some very bizarre things. Take hoarding, for example. I need 80 rolls of toilet paper, seven gallons of hand sanitizer, and 14 pounds of chicken in my house at all times. Why? Because you're afraid. Right, Because you're afraid that something crazy is going to happen and all of a sudden there's not going to be any more food anywhere, even though literally our towns are surrounded by places that sell food. I mean, there's like seven of them within a square mile of my house. And yet we're, we're just like bottled up with fear that all of a sudden I'm not going to be able to get anything. What is that? 
That is us being sort of unreasonable because of fear. I remember this um, in my own life when my first child, uh, James, was born. So we were so afraid that something might happen to James that we tried to control everything, okay? Everything. I mean, my child, it was like my child was being tracked by the CIA because he was under constant surveillance, all right? I mean, all the time. And I remember the moment that I realized how ridiculous I was being because I was setting the table for dinner and James was sitting in a rock and play, which is sort of like a baby seat. And I, um, I bumped into something as I was turning around to go set the table and dropped a steak knife, okay? Not a regular knife, a steak knife right over his head. Okay, so he's sitting in the seat. I turn around, drop, and I'm not kidding you. I, it was like I watched the steak knife fall in slow motion. Okay, it's like I'm watching the steak knife fall towards like my sweet angel son, Cal, right? Like my, my son, James, it's like precious baby I've been trying to protect. And the steak knife falls and lands next to his leg, does no damage. And James kind of cocks his head and looks at me with this look of like, everything okay, dad? You know, like, and in that moment, I realized two things. Number one, I realized it is impossible to protect my children from everything that might happen to them. And number two, that I am probably the greatest danger to my children anyway. Right? And so I say all that to, it's not I'm saying all that to say, hey, don't protect your kids or don't buy extra toilet paper or whatever. I'm just making the point that fear can lead us to do some bizarre things and at times selfish things, can it? I mean, haven't you experienced that in your life? Look at Abram. I mean, fear led this man, this man of God, to become totally self consumed, to think only about himself and no one else. Now, I doubt that you've ever offered your spouse to become the concubine of a foreign dignitary, okay? but we do this in our own way, right? Fear at work leads you to overwork and to neglect your family, right? You're afraid that if you don't produce, if you don't respond to every email right away, you're gonna get let go, you're gonna get fired, you're, you're not gonna get that promotion. And so what do you do? You check your phone before and after dinner, right? You pull your laptop out on vacation and you're never really present with your family because you're always checking, you've always gotta be on. Why? Because you're afraid. Fear of being alone leads you to bounce from one dating app to the next dating app. Always on the go, always looking for romance because you're so afraid of being alone, you can't sit and be single for a season. Fear of being hurt leads you to be relationally superficial and shut down in social settings. You end up feeling isolated and alone because you just can't bear the fact that you might be hurt and so you're shut down and you won't let anybody in. Fear of being rejected keeps you from confessing sin to anyone. It keeps you from initiating towards people in our church that look different than you. And it keeps you from sharing your faith. Fear leads you and fear leads me to do all sorts of bizarre and destructive things. But here's the thing, fear isn't reality. Fear is not reality. Take Abram, for example. He didn't know what the Egyptians were gonna do. He just thought he knew. When the Egyptians find out that Sarah is actually his wife, do you know what they do? They send him on his way. They didn't kill him. They didn't do this thing that he was convinced that they were gonna do. You see, friends, fear is a false prophet. Fear is a false prophet. It claims to know the future, but it doesn't. Can we all just have an honest moment with each other? We don't know the future. You might think you know what your boss is gonna say. You might think you know what your spouse is gonna say. You might think you know what your neighbor or your roommate is gonna say, but you don't. You don't know. There are just too many variables in life. You don't know what's gonna happen. You are not God. But fear makes us think we are. Fear makes us think, I know exactly what's gonna happen, so I gotta grab control of this thing, and I gotta ask my wife to marry this Egyptian, and I gotta move down to Egypt, and I gotta move cities, and I gotta get a new marriage, and I gotta get a new job. Why? Because I'm afraid of what's gonna happen. Friends, you don't know. Fear is a false prophet. And when we obsess about what the future holds, we become self-consumed and bizarre. When we experience famine, the question that we're tempted to ask is this, what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen to me? That's what fear says, what's gonna happen to me? But friends, here's the question that we should ask. Here's the question that Abraham should have asked. What is God calling me to do? Not what is gonna happen to me, but what is God calling me to do? Because if you are where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to be doing, you can trust him to provide what you need when you need it. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter six, verses 33 through 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So friends, learn from Abram's mistake. When you experience famine, live by faith and not by fear. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 14 with me. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and for her sake he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. This passage shows us just how far Abraham had fallen. He didn't just sneak over the border of Egypt. He went all the way down to the capital city and started mingling with the royal court. I mean, this was a full-fledged return to his lifestyle in Ur. This was all the way back to what he was doing before. And as he mingled with the princes of Pharaoh, they in fact noticed that Sarah was both beautiful and according to Abraham, available. And so they told Pharaoh about her and Pharaoh took her into his house to become one of his wives. And as Sarah's oldest male relative, Abram was entitled to a dowry or a bride price. And so that's what Pharaoh paid him. That's what verse 16 is all about. All that stuff that he gets was a dowry. It was a bride price. Friends, you see, sometimes when you abandon your calling, you will experience prosperity. You get the bigger house, you get the nicer car, you get the fatter salary, but that is different than blessing. Do not confuse prosperity with blessing. Scripture is clear that a blessed man can be content and satisfied with little, but a cursed man cannot be satisfied or content no matter how much he acquires. Don't equivocate prosperity with God's approval of your choices. Don't equivocate prosperity with God's approval of your choices. Abraham experienced prosperity, but it was not blessing. And what we'll find in chapter 13 is it ends up causing all kinds of heartache in his family. So let's keep reading. Verse. So here's what we need to know. Sarai is in Pharaoh's house. Abram's doing nothing. He's just like counting up his new livestock and Pharaoh's about to sleep with her, okay? Like the entire redemptive plan of the Bible is on a razor's edge because if Pharaoh gets Sarai pregnant, then who's who's gonna have Isaac, right? Who's gonna have a child for Abram? Everything is falling apart. And then verse 17, but the Lord. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram went up from Egypt he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the Negev. Verse 17 is the first time God is mentioned in this passage. And the phrase, but the Lord, sets the action of God in contrast to the action of Abram. Abram abandoned his wife, but God defended her. Abram abandoned the promised land, but God brought him back. What's interesting about chapter 12 is that it begins and ends with go. At the beginning, God said, Abraham, get thee out of Haran and go to the promised land. And at the end, Pharaoh said to Abraham, get thee out of Egypt and go back to the promised land. Here's the big idea from these verses. Even though Abram did everything he could to ruin it, God protected and upheld his purposes. Which leads, which leads us to the last thing that we learn. When you experience famine, remember that God is in control. When you experience famine, remember that God is in control. Famine makes us feel just how little control of our lives we really have. And that is a very hard feeling for us. So we start grasping for ways to control it. I'll move to Egypt. I'll tell Pharaoh that Sarah is my sister. I'll move cities, change jobs. I'll get a new marriage, whatever. I'll get on another dating app. But friends, the truth is, no matter how good your circumstances are, you're never really in control. And no matter how bad your circumstances are, God is never out of control. No matter how good circum how no matter how good your circumstances are, you're never really in control. I mean, things could change like that. And no matter how bad your circumstances are, God is never out of control. That's what we see in Abram's story. God was in control the entire time. When Abram abandoned his wife, God fought for her. When Abram abandoned the promised land, God brought him back. 
If you are going to live by faith in the midst of hard times, if you are going to live by faith in the midst of famine, you have to learn to believe in God's sovereignty. And sovereignty is simply a theological word that means everything is under control, you're just not the one controlling it. Sovereignty means everything is under control, you're just not the one controlling it. God is. And that's good news. That is good news because God is more qualified to control your life than you are. He sees every angle. He knows every variable and he possesses unlimited wisdom. And friend, if you are in Christ, one of the most precious promises of the scriptures is that God is working all things in this crazy world towards your good and his glory. If you are in Christ, that is true of you. It doesn't always feel that way, but it's true. Think of it like a tapestry. So a tapestry is a beautiful picture that's created by weaving various colors and lengths of thread together. One side of a tapestry is a work of art. It's ordered, it's beautiful, it's thoughtful, it's purposeful. You can obviously see what the picture is, but the other side is a total mess because it's where all the threads are being tied off. There's knots everywhere, there's, there's colors clashing, there's no seeming order to the tapestry, totally random and chaotic. That's your life. God is weaving your life into a beautiful tapestry, but oftentimes you can only see the chaotic side. God is weaving your life into a beautiful tapestry for your good and his glory, but friends, oftentimes in this life, all we can see is the chaotic side. And it's in those moments that by faith, we have to trust the artist. By faith, we have to trust the wisdom and the skill and the timing of the artist when we don't understand what he's doing. In this passage, Abraham was an absolute screw up. I mean, there's no other way to put it. He was not a good and faithful man. He was a wicked man. You should be horrified at Abram's behavior in this chapter. And yet, God welcomed him back. He just welcomed him back. Look at chapter 13, verse one. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him back into the Negev. God welcomed him back. He got to come right back to the promised land. He still got to have the incredible promises of God. He still got to inherit the land and have descendants numerous as stars of the sky. How is that possible? How could God just welcome back this faithless man who had betrayed his wife and had lived a totally self-absorbed, worldly, comfort-oriented life? How could he welcome him back? God could welcome him back because God's relationship with Abram, listen, wasn't based on Abram's performance. It was based on God's grace. Sometimes people have this idea that the idea of grace is a New Testament concept and not an Old Testament concept. Friend, from the very beginning, the only way that God relates to people is through grace because it's the only option. If you are trying to relate to God based off of your good deeds and your performance, building a stairway to heaven, I have bad news for you. You're never gonna be able to build one high enough. But the good news of Abram's story is even when you are a total screw up, even when you blow it, even when you disappoint yourself, God is still extending towards you. You see, Abram's relationship wasn't based on his performance. It was based on God's grace. And don't, don't be mistaken, one day Abram's sin would be paid for. It would be paid for by ultimately the person whom Abram points us to, the truer and better Abram, Jesus Christ. Think with me for just a moment. Abram left his father's house, so did Jesus. Abram went to a new land, so did Jesus. Abram created a new people, so did Jesus. But instead of lying, Jesus always told the truth. Instead of sacrificing his bride, Jesus sacrificed himself for his bride, the church. And instead of being a curse to the nations, Jesus became a blessing to all nations. Because of Jesus and his work, no matter how far down you've gone into Egypt, and no matter how long you've been there, if you turn around, if you repent, God will welcome you back just like he did Abram. Why? Because your sins have been paid for by the truer and better Abram, Jesus Christ. Friend, famine is coming. Famine is 
coming. And when it comes in your life, when hardship comes in your life, let the example of Abram be a warning to you and let the work of Christ be a blessing to you so that you might walk by faith and not by fear in the midst of famine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the honesty of your scriptures. That, Lord, you did not relate to Abram because he was a perfect man, but you related to Abraham because of your grace. God, I pray that every one of us who is listening today would be encouraged by that. Would we be encouraged by your grace? We'd also be challenged by Abraham's story that we wouldn't make those same mistakes, God, that we would not be people who shirk back in fear, but we would be people who press forward in faith, believing that your promises hold true for us and believing that in Christ, in Christ, we have the greatest assurance that you are for us and that you are working out all things for our good. Lord, give us faith to walk in this challenging season as people that glorify you. Amen.